Welcome to Hawthorne. I'm Julian Slowick, and tonight it'll be our pleasure to feed you. Chef Slowick is an internationally renowned cook in charge of an exclusive restaurant on a private island. He's able to charge twelve fifty a head, freely experiment with his dishes, and command an adoring staff. I love you all. We, we love, love you too, too, Chef! At first glance, it seems as if he's reached the absolute pinnacle of his craft, achieving everything an aspiring restaurateur could ever dream of. Yet, we soon learn that things aren't quite as rosy as they would seem. Slowick is, in fact, being exploited. Thank you for dining with us tonight. You represent the ruin of my art and my life. Just look at each of the guests that are invited to dine at Hawthorne that fateful night. Oh, this ongoing obsession with snow. It's officially a plague and no one is immune. Lillian, the critic, and Ted, the publisher, suck the pleasure out of cooking by using it to advance their careers. They hunt for the next scoop by inventing new words, finding minor faults, and reading into everything that the chef does. There's a neediness to the plating, you know? I mean, it's been tweezered to fuck, but the flavors are there, it's very clean, it's very, um, thalassic. Oh, you well, at least we have work. And money. <laughs> To work and money. Yeah, baby. Mm -hmm. yeah, baby. We're pathetic, aren't we? Oh my god, dude. Somebody shoot us. The finance bros embezzle money into their own pockets instead of supporting Slowick and the restaurant staff, the ones that are actually producing value. What are, what are these? These are tortillas, which contain Echo Bright's tax records and other documents showing how your company has created invoices with fake charges. Doug Verrick is my angel investor. He owns this island and this restaurant. The angel investor commodifies Slowick's craft, leading to the chef's creative decisions being compromised in the pursuit of profits. When he questioned my menu, he would even request substitutions, despite the fact that there are no substitutions at Hawthorne! My loyal regulars. How many times have you eaten here in the last five years? I don't know, six or seven. The billionaire regulars only dine at Hawthorne so that they can maintain their status as elites, without actually caring about the food being served. <sighs> Mr. Liebrand, kindly name one dish you ate the last time you were here. Do you make that with a Paco Jet? Exactly right, sir. Yes. You know, a Paco Jet can produce a powderized, uh, snow-like texture. Tyler uses the fame of Slowick and his restaurant to uphold his identity as a man of wealth and taste that supposedly knows everything about fine dining. Everyone gather around. We must learn from Tyler. This is a, a, new, uh, a new dicing method of which we have been woefully ignorant. It's not brain surgery, okay? okay? It's, so it's a goddamn it. travel food show. Yeah, yeah. So, so pitch it to me. The movie star uses Hawthorne as practice for an upcoming food show that might revive his own career without really noticing what he's eating. How is it? Mmm. It's good. You can't just say good for the show. You have to, you have to embellish. Each of the diners are takers. Not only do they physically take the food they are given, but they also take the opportunities of dining at an elite restaurant to further their own goals and stroke their own egos. You love that I texted you an invitation for this evening. Me yearning for your attendance. <laughs> your ego was fed. This is all done at the expense of Slowick, who has gradually seen all the pleasure drain from his art. He no longer enjoys making food and serving his customers. I used to. I haven't desired to cook for someone in ages. The only one that doesn't use Hawthorne for their own gain is Margot. This is something that baffles Slowick. He has become so accustomed to guests exploiting him that the minute someone refuses to take, he becomes suspicious. My name is Margot. I've served many Margots. You're not a Margot. Of course, it soon becomes clear why Margot doesn't take. She herself is a service worker in disguise. Not that you guys give a single flying fuck, but my name is not Margot. Using the emotional intelligence that she's learned in her career as an escort, Margot is able to deduce the parasitic relationship that links each of Slowick's guests. She is also able to discover that once upon a time, 
Slowik was able to find joy and fulfillment in his craft, not when he was making overcomplicated dishes designed to placate delicate egos and fill out pretentious magazine articles, but when he was making simple food that people actually wanted to eat. Of course, the embodiment of this simple, delightful food is the mighty cheeseburger. To some, most notably snobs, it may seem mundane and mass-produced, especially when compared to haute cuisine, but to others it is simply a tasty treat that can be exquisite if made well. This parallels the world of fine art, where genres such as still life were historically looked down upon when compared to more highbrow art forms like religious painting. Of course, this didn't stop great artists like Cezanne from painting the same apples over and over again. Gifted with a unique insight into the chef's life, Margot can see that Sloic was truly happy when he was simply flipping burgers at Hamburger Howie's back in the late 1980s. Since then, it's clear that he's been pressured to elevate his craft to the rigorous standards expected by the status-obsessed customers and critics that he now serves. Standards that he still cannot meet. And I've been fooled in trying to satisfy people who can never be satisfied. With this knowledge, Margot gives Sloic the opportunity to do something he has been craving. To cook a meal that his customer actually wants. Well, what are you hungry for? You know what I'd really like? Tell me. A cheeseburger. Despite its simplicity as a dish, the chef clearly finds far more enjoyment in cooking a burger than anything else he's cooked that evening. He gives attention to every detail, right down to the type of fry and the qualities of the cheese he's melting. American cheese is the best cheese for a cheeseburger because it melts without splitting. The straightforward task of making a cheeseburger reminds Sloic of why he began cooking and why he fell in love with it. The simple act of preparing a simple meal for someone who is truly grateful for it. Like Cezanne, Sloic is liberated by completely disregarding the hierarchy of art and plainly enjoying the process of making. Instead of taking away from the arts, as have all of the other guests, Margot has actually given something back to Sloic. She has given him a Proustian moment, transporting him back to a time when he could just make good food without any fear of judgment. This is why Margot is allowed to escape and keep her cheeseburger. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking and subscribing. I'm sure there's lots of other videos on the channel that you might enjoy as well. Thanks.